Hi there, my name is Evan Carter. I'm a reporter with Michigan Capital Confidential. Today I'm joined by Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly. He's running as a Republican candidate for governor. Thank you for being with us today. Pleasure Governor to be Kelly. On. Pleasure to be on with you. So to jump in today, why do you stay in Michigan and what do you most love about the state? Well, this is where I'm from. This is my home. You know, as I was growing up, and uh, mo most of my growing up was in rural Ionia County, and I met, you know, I met this girl in high school, and I was all in. So uh, she's a farm girl, and she wasn't going anywhere. So you know, in the beginning, that was uh, that was the thing that uh, that I would say was the biggest inspiration to stay. But this is, I mean, this is the best state in so many different ways, from from the natural resources to the the quality of life to the opportunity, just good, strong, hard-working people. You know, the storied history, but more important than that, the potential for the future. I mean, everything about our state is the best, and that's why I'm going to live here for the rest of my life. Now, transitioning into policy, um, recently the General Fund of Michigan has put about a billion dollars per year in select tax credits to specific businesses, and last year there's two more tax credits signed that do similar types of things. Would you say that's a positive thing, or is that a negative one? Well, I've, I've done a lot of work over the course of the last seven years in eliminating uh, tax credits. A lot of my tax policy work is to, has been to, uh, to simplify the tax code, particularly the corporate tax code, which is the cleanest tax code in the whole uh, nation. And then, um, and then also when we eliminated the industrial personal property tax, um, that was the most abated tax that we had in Michigan. And so... Um, instead of having a system where some people pay it and some don't, we just get rid of the whole thing for all taxpayers. Um, so a lot of the the uh, expenses that we see today in tax credits are leftover tax credits from the previous administration. So those have a, a, a period of time where they just run their course. Uh, th the way that it was done in the past was, was wrong for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, you can't make up for a bad environment with tax credits. And that's what they tried to do in the first decade of the century. You, had, you know, the, the, the tax situation was uncompetitive, or labor laws were uncompetitive, or regulatory environment was un uncompetitive. And so what they would say to businesses is, if you put up with all this, we'll pay you. Well, that just doesn't work because you got to, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have a better environment for, for everybody. So rule number one is tax credits cannot be used to make up for a bad environment. So most of my time and effort has been how do you make it, the environment better for everybody? And then, um, and then to the extent that there are going to be tax, uh, either tax credits or grants or anything of that nature, uh, my only request is that you have to treat it like an appropriation, that you have to treat it as a spending decision because ultimately that's what it is. What you're saying is here's a project of some sort and there's some benefit to you know, overall society that is so great that we're going to make an appropriation to accomplish it. I think that's the standard for it. And it's not an impossible standard to make, but ultimately it should be the exception as opposed to the rule. Okay. And then another issue that you'd have to deal with as governor would be criminal justice issues. What do you think about this, this field of the governorship? And is there an issue there that you think is particularly important for you to tackle? Well, with criminal justice reform, I think this is one of the the biggest untold stories of the successes of of, uh, of recent years, where we have taken a treatment based approach to dealing with crime. Take addiction, for example. Over the course of of decades, we have tried to treat addiction by putting people in jail, and I think it's safe to say, after all this time, that that has been a spectacular failure. That when you have to treat the addiction itself. And if you treat the addiction, your long-term outcomes are much better. The other thing is when, uh, the other thing that, we, uh, that we've really focused on is job training for people that are in prison. So as they ap approach their release date, you know, why not teach them how to do something like plumbing or carpentry or CNC machining, something in demand, welding, that is in demand so when they get out, connect them with an employer and an opportunity to, to live a different type of a life. We've been doing that now for a couple of years, making a big difference. Today in Michigan, recidivism is at its lowest point ever. It's 28.1%. 20 years ago, it was 45.7%. So when you consider that type of a dramatic improvement, it's very clear why the prison population has topped out over 50,000, just fell below 40,000. So we made a lot of great progress, but we can do even more. And it's the idea of being smart on crime and easy on taxpayers. That's the, that's the, the beauty of this, is that it's, 
it doesn't work and it's expensive to do it the old fashioned way when it's just throw the book at everybody and don't worry about the root causes of the problems. So uh, mental health diversion courts and, and uh, veteran specific efforts and addiction treatment courts and job training. I mean, these are the sorts of things where you break the cycle and make a really big difference. So I will continue to stay focused on it. It's been a real passion of mine because uh, we've, we've experienced a lot of great outcomes when it comes to making changes. And yet uh, our, uh, our system is still, the, the treatment courts are like the exception to the regular system. I think we're at a point now to where our courts all need to be problem solving courts. Another thing that um, would come up on your desk potentially is tax cuts. It's a hot issue with the legislature. Sure. If a tax cut to lower the personal income tax down to 3.9% was on your desk, as governor, would you sign it? Here's my conditions. I'm, I've, I've done handled more tax credits than anybody else in this race by far. Right? So I've personally handled massive tax cuts, multiple um, massive tax cuts here in our state. The um, it, what you have to keep the budget balance. So what I would want to see is the way that we did it in 2011. We did a massive tax cut, and we did it with the budget, and we showed that we're going to keep it balanced. We're not going to we're not going to push it off onto the next generation. And ask them to figure it out. That we did at the same time. We proposed a, a budget that fit in a tax cut, and so we did both conservative things: reduce taxes and keep the budget balanced. Beyond that, though. We have to continue to reduce the debt. So we have a debt payoff schedule that's in place right now. We're recognizing now the size of the debt more so than any other administration in the past. You know, others kind of fudged the numbers to make it look like pension liabilities were smaller than they were. We, we're realistic in our estimates on what, what the liability really is, and we've been faithful about reducing it. It's actually been reduced by $23 billion, and, uh, and that's something that we can all be proud of. We have a schedule to pay it off completely over the next 20 years. So I would want to make sure that we keep on that path to paying off the debt. We can have a debt-free Michigan, and that's an important aspect. So the answer is, yes, we can continue to cut taxes, but you got to do it the right way. you got to keep the budget balanced, and you got to pay off the debt. Okay. Moving into environmental issues, in 2008, former Governor Jennifer Granholm signed the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard into law, and then Governor Snyder extended it in 2016. And essentially, what it means for viewers is about 15% of the energy produced by energy producers in the state comes from renewable energy sources. Was that a good move to have the RPS, or was that a bad move? Well, I, I, I think generally speaking that the that the that at least the major utilities were moving that direction in it. Anyway, um, so I don't know that as a practical implication it made that big of a difference either way. But generally speaking, um, you don't, I mean, the market should drive these uh, decisions and what the best type. There's going to be environmental uh, requirements uh, regarding pollution, particularly considering our um, our natural resources and our special uh, heritage and responsibility here as being the uh, the stewards of the largest deposit of fresh water anywhere in the country or in the in the world, but but ultimately, given that, the um, the the way that our electricity is produced, finding the the lowest cost, most reliable sources of electricity that meet our environmental standards, uh, that that's what should drive the decisions, not a, an arbitrary standard. And then another issue in energy is the cost. According to the EIA, it's the government agency that tracks energy use in the United States, Michigan has on average the highest residential electricity rates in the Midwest. As governor, what would you do to address those electricity rates for consumers? Well, one thing I think we need to, uh, we need to accommodate more easily is this transition to, uh, to natural gas. It's a domestic source. So importing in the old days, you know, over time we were always importing um, our energy, our base energy source from other places. We buy in other states coal, and then have to bring it to Michigan, and um, and so that's there's just extra expense with that. But now there's been there have been so many huge natural gas deposits that have found in Michigan that um, that I, I think it's time to really build up the electrical infrastructure around that domestic source. So I think we have opportunities for additional um, for additional savings. And the beauty about it is that a it burns clean, right? There's no 
emission left over from natural gas. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get a, a, a cleaner environment and you have a domestic source. So are there any issues that you think make life harder in Michigan for the state's low income residents? The way that our social service system works right now, I think too often it holds people down. It creates disincentives to go out there and take chances and get back to work because we have these cliffs, right? There's, uh, and most of them are federal programs that are just administered by the state. But, but uh, there's a cliff where it says, well, you know, you got an income level, and if you're below that income level, then you're in, you get that support. If you're $1 above, you're out. And so what happens is people tend to manage their lives underneath that line. And it's not good, it's not good for them, it's not good for our society. And, um, and yet, you know, that it, it creates a disincentive to go out there and try because you know, it's perceived as being very high risk. So we really have to help people to get back to work and have the confidence to do so. Um, and and part, one thing that we could do is work with the, the federal government and, and kind of you know, just helping people get a glide path off. I think there are people that, um, that, that want to go back to work and kind of feel trapped in our social service system. Um, so I would transform our social service system into uh, the very application. So if somebody needs help, they make an application to get help. Transform that very application into a, a making a plan for independence. Because what we should be expecting is a person become as independent as they possibly can. Now a person might have a disability or something that, that, that where they're always going to require some help. But even people with disabilities want to be more independent. And this is a... Um, and this is something that I think our social service system kind of misses, that instead of, it's not good enough just to sustain or help a person survive at a point of dependence. It's important that we help them live a life of dependence and reach their full potential and go out there and live a more self-determined life. Is there any issue that you think is really, really important that we have not covered so far? What's the most pressing issue in the state right now? Well, there are two, there are two things that I would point to. First is our, our public education system. It needs a lot of work. It's, it's, um, we, we have to ensure that our, our kids, there's a lot of early childhood efforts, and yet kids are still coming to school and not ready to learn. And, um, and then the, the literacy rates in our, in our state need to be improved. Special education, we cannot set aside or brush aside the needs of kids that have disabilities, that, that we have to teach them too and effectively teach them. We need to build, bring back skilled trades to our high schools, use the trades to teach the academics and, and not take this one size fits all approach. I mean, there are so many important things or aspects to it, but we've got to do better with our, our primary education system. And then uh, the other thing I'd point to is roads. Now we do have a, a package phasing in right now. Um, th this year there'll be more going to, uh, to roads and in better ways than in the past than we've ever had before. Um, that'll phase and it'll get up to about 1.2 billion. Now, when you put the 1.2 billion extra along with um, the the changes and in, in increases in the standards uh, of the roads, which really only make a difference when you're replacing the road, you know, repairs on a 40-year-old road don't hold together no matter how hard you try. Uh, a lot of our roads just need to flat out be replaced. But we also need to do uh, we have we need to be more efficient. We have two uh, uh, pilots that are going right now on integrated asset management. And what this means is you take everybody who is uh, sharing the right of way in roads. So you have, there's literally hundreds or even thousands of entities around the state that share the rights of way. So you got roads, townships, um, in, in counties and villages and um, in the state, along with um, utilities and electricity um, and communications infrastructure, water and sewer, you know, all these different entities that share that same right of way. They're all doing independent maintenance and repair and replacement work. So if you were to coordinate all of that action, so that when you tear up the road, you only do it once. And while you're doing that, you do whatever water infrastructure work needs to be done. You maybe bury the electric cable at the time or whatever. You do all that at the same time that everybody ends up saving. Could be very substantial savings. The, the pilots that we have going right now will prove that out. But taking that concept statewide will help the current dollars go even further. And then engineering projects better is important as well. Um, we're on the on the front end of making these uh, making these changes, but on M23, for example, in um, near Ann Arbor, there was a need for an additional lane going both ways. Well, when you add in a lane, you got to widen bridges that cross over the free. It's really really expensive. It's going to be four hundred million dollars. Well, 
our transportation fund can't handle an extra four hundred million dollars. And so what um, what what we did instead was we made modifications to the shoulders and made the road smart roads so it could when you could you could temporarily turn the shoulder into a lane during the rush hour traffic times and um, and then add smart signage up where where it showed drivers told drivers uh, what to do in those cases where the where the uh, shoulder is being used as a lane and it turned a four hundred million dollar project into a one hundred million dollar project and so that's a those types of changes will help the dollars go further so our infrastructure um, you know multiple administrations in a row have let it fall into disrepair to to the point where now it's we just have so many 40 year old roads that were built of 20 year specifications. And uh, so there's a ton of work that needs to be done, but that work has begun. And as we ramp up these efforts of, um, of accelerating the, um, the repairs and replacements themselves, building them to higher and better standards and um, engineering them more efficiently and um, implementing integrated asset management will have a better future for our state. Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for your time today. Great to be with you. Um, follow us at micapcon.com and on Facebook for more interviews with uh, gubernatorial candidates in the coming months. And if you enjoy our analysis of politics and policy, check us out as well. Thank you so much for watching today. Mm -hmm.